and she did this whole thing, not feeling well, and you can tell she did it completely under the Lord. Amen. It, she's an example of someone that's instant in season and out of season, so I want to give her another round of applause. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well now it's time for Q&A, and uh, gentlemen, I tried to give you some questions that you guys are, would be good at. Um, I, I worked, I had to move fast, so hopefully you'll enjoy these questions. Um, we're going to try to keep our answers pithy. <laughs> So we can get through as many questions as we can. And I'm going to go ahead and start with the big elephant in the room. All right. What are your, <clears throat> what are your views on the Asbury revival? <laughs> and um, I, as this whole thing is broken out, I'll just give you my own perspective. I think there's two ditches to stay out of. One extreme just contemns it without knowing the evidence, because we have had revivals in America. Uh, I would encourage you to see the Jesus Revolution movie that just came out. It's a whole movie on the 60s yeah. revival. It's, I've seen it. It's very good. The other extreme I've noticed is just to endorse it without testing the spirits. Uh, we're commanded in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, to test the spirits, which at a bare minimum requires probationary analysis before you render judgment. And I'm waiting to see if this so-called revival is going to conform to the pattern of revivals in Scripture. Scripture has four revivals in it. Uh, in every single one, it's preceded by a proclamation of God's Word. Uh, Nehemiah 8, the revival under another one under Josiah, Jonah, and his revival in Nineveh, and then Peter, Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost. Every single one of them is connected intimately with Scripture. And is this a true revival or not? I'm waiting to see if the Word of God in this revival is going to become more prominent or less prominent. And once I see evidence one way or the other, uh, I'll make a decision. So I, I personally don't know, and I think those are... Regardless of what you think about it, I think those are some good rules of thumb to follow. Absolutely. Uh, let's, let's stay out of the it's satanic ditch, and let's stay out of, let's uh, rush to coronation without having the evidence. The Holy Spirit is not schizophrenic. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. So whatever the Holy Spirit is allegedly doing at Asbury is going to be consistent with Scripture. And so let's, um, let's wait until the evidence comes in. Uh, that's my take on it. Let's, Andy? Yeah. If I, it, Thank you. Amen. Do it. Yeah, I, I want to add just two verses of Scripture to back up what you just said. And I'm going to do the Jewish thing. I'm going to, I'm going to quote another rabbi. You know, you know, we Jews, we always quote another rabbi so we don't get in trouble if, if you don't agree. I'm going to quote Gamaliel in, uh, yeah. in uh, Acts 5. Rabbi Gamaliel, who's a rabbi who taught everything Paul knew from Jude of Judaism. And he said this, 538, 39. So in the present case, I said to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan of action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Or else you may be even found fighting against God. So just to back up what Andy just said. Okay, the uh, question that I have here is this, is the invasion by the bear from the north, Russia. I assume this is referring to Ezekiel 38 and 39, where it talks about Rosh coming down against uh, Israel, uh, together with Meshach, Te uh, Tubal, and other specified allies. And I would say that uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is that uh, when C.I. Schofield uh, wrote his uh, study Bible, what was that, 1909, somewhere around there, he uh, identified this as Russia, primarily based upon uh, linguistics, primarily just based upon it sound like Russia, and um, that Tubal and, and uh, 
the other cities sounded like uh, uh, cities that are, Meshek was Moscow and Tubal was Tobolsk. And uh, that has been pretty well discredited over the years in the 20th century by serious scholarship in this area. And uh, there have been serious books uh, on this written by Ron Rhodes, uh, Mark Hitchcock, uh, uh, Andy has written about it, and a lot of research has gone into this, including historical research going back to the writings of Josephus. And based upon those, uh, uh, those articles that have been written, I think that uh, people are pretty well convinced that uh, the leader will be Russia, but not based upon uh, things sounding uh, like Russia, but on what those words really meant at the time that the Bible was written, and that it would include Russia together with uh, what we call the, uh, uh, the Muslim uh, nations of Russia, which is central Russia, will all come down against uh, uh, Israel in the end times in what's called the War of Gog and Magog. Uh, incidentally, I have uh, just, uh, when I retired from uh, Lamb and Lion Ministries in, uh, as the leader in uh, 2021, I moved my office to my home, and I have been focusing on writing, and so I've written four books since that time, and the fourth one just went to the printer. We hope to have it maybe by April. It's called The Nine Wars of the End Times, and uh, so I wrote it because people are always calling me and asking me, is the latest war in the, in the Middle East the War of Armageddon? And I found out that most people... That's the only war they know about in the end times. They've heard of Gog and Magog, but don't know much about it. Uh, but I have tried to outline nine wars that the Bible teaches in the end times. The first one that I mention in that book is uh, a war that is debated as to whether or not really it is an end time war. And that's Psalm 83. Uh, and so I, I present simply both sides of that and, and how many people feel like it's a war that's not in the end times and others feel like it is in the end times. And it's a war of annihilation against Israel. Many believe it was the war of 1967. Um, but it's a war that only includes the nations that have a common border with Israel. And then uh, the second one would be the war of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And again, the question about that, that is definitely a war of the end times. But the question is, when is it going to happen? And again, there's great division of opinion among those who interpret Bible prophecy literally. I would say that for most of uh, 100 years, people said it was going to start at the beginning of the, uh, of the tribulation because it's going to start when, Russia, when Israel is living in security. And so people would say, well, the tribulation is going to begin with uh, a peace treaty with Israel. So it has to start at the beginning of the tribulation. But I, that view has shifted considerably in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, and some very fine scholars like Ron Rhodes and others are now taking the position that it's going to be in the interim between the time of the, of the, uh, uh, of the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. The rapture does not begin the tribulation. The signing of a treaty with Israel begins it. So um, I would say that probably the majority viewpoint right now is it's going to start maybe three and a half years before uh, the tribulation uh, starts. And one of the reasons for that is because it's going to take seven years for Israel to uh, burn up all of the weapons that are left over from that war. And Israel's not going to be there for seven years. They're going to be run out of Israel by the Antichrist, the Jews are, at the very uh, big, uh, center or middle of the tribulation. And then very quickly, the third war would be what I call the war, uh, third World War III, which I think is the war of the uh, seals, uh, when one-fourth of humanity is killed. The Antichrist is not going to be some charismatic, dynamic individual that the whole world is going to come and bow down to and say, we love you and we want to worship you. Uh, he may take over uh, Europe that way, but he's going to have to take the world over by military force. Africa, Asia, and Africa uh, and Latin America spent 200 years getting rid of European colonialism. And they're not going to turn around and say to some European leader, come and rule us. He's going to have to conquer them. And then the fourth war would be the War of the Trumpets, which I think is... Uh, the World War III morphing into a nuclear war. And I believe there's going to be a nuclear war and uh, another third of humanity will uh, be killed. It talks about things being burned up during that time. The next war will be the war right in the middle of the tribulation when uh, you have a supernatural war in the heavens and Michael fights uh, 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 Satan and his forces and Satan is thrown down to earth and given no more uh, 
uh, access to heaven. And then the next war will be the war against the Jewish people, which occurs during the second half of the tribulation when the Antichrist tries to annihilate the Jewish people from the face of the earth. And then I think Daniel 11 presents another war. And I think what happens is that the Antichrist re goes back to his headquarters and the, the whole world begins to uh, revolt against him. And what happens is that uh, it's led in the Middle East and he brings a great army into the Middle East and just walks all through the Middle East down to Egypt and uh, conquers all of it. But it's interesting. It says he is not allowed to enter modern day Jordan. And I think that's because that's where the Jews are going to be. Right. And so then he, he hears about armies coming from the East, which scares him to death. And he starts retreating. And he says he retreats back to between the two great seas and the North of the beautiful city. So he, he ends up in the valley of Armageddon between the two seas and north of the city of Jerusalem. And he's waiting there, I think, for people who are revolting against him. The eastern nations are coming to revolt against him. And uh, at that point, uh, we're told that the Lord returns. The Lord speaks a supernatural wor word. There is no battle of Armageddon. No armies are sent out. Uh, to fight uh, the armies of the Antichrist. He just speaks the supernatural word. Just the one who spoke and the whole world came into existence. And he will speak and they will drop dead in their tracks. Their eyes will melt in their mouth. Their tongues, their skin drop from their bodies. And uh, the Lord will uh, then begin his reign. And the final of those nine wars is going to be uh, the, war, the second war of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium when Satan is released and those in the flesh uh, a great number of them revolt and try to overthrow Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then the eternal state starts and no war anymore. It's all peace and uh, from then on. So it's all yours. Wow. <laughs> I have to say I'm impressed except that David doesn't know anything about marketing because he gave you the whole book. You should have stopped at <laughs> seven or eight. I need to become your agent. Okay. <laughs> uh, They're dear. not going to buy the book now. <laughs> wow. That was good. Um, okay. Is replacement theology dangerous? Should I worry about my loved ones or is it something that is not worth addressing? Uh, so uh, I, I take it that the person who wrote the question is, uh, is worried about uh, talking to their loved ones who are, uh, you know, adhering to this position of, of replacement theology or superstitionism, which is the view that God is done with Israel uh, and has replaced Israel with the church. And so uh, is, it, is it that big of a deal that I should not bother my loved ones with it? Or the, the answer is replacement theology is really, really a problem, okay? Two-thirds of Christendom actually adheres to that view. And, uh, and really, there's nowhere in the Bible where you can defend that position if you take a literal grammatical historical approach to, uh, to the Bible. The, it, the simple answer is if, if you say that God has replaced Israel with the church, then you simply make God into a covenant breaker and a liar because he promised he was never going to rene renege on Israel. The best verse for that is probably a one you know, which is in Jeremiah 31, 35 through 37, about, you know, if you can count the stars and measure the sun and the moon, then I will forsake Israel for all that they have done to me. The end of that verse, for the, all that they have done to me, God is recognizing that we, the Jews, have disobeyed him over and over and over. But fortunately for us, his covenants with us are not based on our performance. They're based on his character. And God never changes. So God will not, God does not believe in replacement theology. It's not biblical. That's the short answer. I don't know what else to tell you. You guys can just add scripture to that, I'm sure. Well, I want to say that I think it's a terrible evil. And uh, it all, it, it's based upon one concept. And that is the Jews committed deicide. They killed God and therefore God washed his hands of them. And it's our responsibility as Christians to harass them and persecute them because they deserve it. And so I want to give you one verse for you to remember. Don't ever forget this verse. It's Acts chapter 4 verse 27 that tells us who killed Jesus. It says, truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus 
whom you did anoint both Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and Israel. So who killed Jesus? It was Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, Israel, and you and me. It was a team effort. <laughs> he died He died for our sins. Amen. We all have the blood of Jesus on our hands, and we shouldn't blame the Jews Amen. and them only. I need to take you on the road with me. <laughs> <laughs> it was Arnold Fruchtenbaum who first told me that if you take the, I think it's close to 70, maybe a few more, a few less, I forgot, uh, instances of the word Israel in the New, New Testament, and you change the word Israel with the word church, then you truly have to do theological gymnastics to make it make any sense, because it just doesn't. May, there may be one verse or two that you could possibly say, this could be referring to the church, but the rest of them, absolutely not. And my favorite verse in the New Testament that really, uh, I, I start with people that, that, that tell me about replacement theology and they think it's, it's a valid view. I start with 1 Corinthians 10, 30, uh, 32. Uh, it's in the context of not eating foods, eating the, the proper food. It says, give no offense, but listen, it describes three groups. Right. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Wait a minute. If the church in the New Testament is replaced the Jews, why do we talk about the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church? Right. It's because they haven't replaced. The church, a healthy church, is made of Jews and Gentiles, yeah. one in Messiah, in the body of Messiah. Amen. Romans 11, Paul begins by saying... Has God rejected his people? And for 2,000 years, the church has said, yes. And what does he say? May it, May never, it be. never be. Right. Amen. 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 I agree with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, a question. If I receive the mark of the beast, is it possible to accept Christ afterwards? And the answer is no. And then I just want to give you the scripture here. Uh, in Revelation chapter 14, I mentioned about the angels that proclaim the gospel. In the very statement, it lets us know that there's no repentance from that. So I'm just going to read uh, Revelation 14, 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in their forehead or in their hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, verse 11, and the smoke of their torments is sent up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever received the mark of his name. So if a person received the mark, I believe that they've crossed over. Uh, I believe that is an unpardonable sin, and uh, you can't repent, repent from it. All right, very good. Um... I'm going to do a couple because they're related and these guys talk too much. So I need to, <laughs> I need to catch up here a little bit, but, um, and they, they know I'm just kidding. Um, okay. It says if Satan is in the abyss during the millennial kingdom, um, where does evil come from? Well, you remember Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. Um, that excuse isn't going to work anymore because Satan is in the abyss and yet mankind still has a propensity for evil. In Zechariah 14 verses 16 through 18, they, even with Jesus reigning on David's throne, there's this growing hatred towards him where they don't want to go to Egypt. Uh, excuse me. Egypt doesn't want to go to Jerusalem to worship the king. So the, the Lord is allowing that whole time period to go forward to show you that you can't blame all evil on the devil. Man is evil even if Satan had no influence over us as well. One of the greatest truths you could ever learn as a Christian is we fight three-dimensional warfare. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And a lot of times they'll tag team on you. But even if Satan is bound, which he will be during the millennial kingdom, the sin nature is, is alive and well. And uh, one other very quickly, what is the purpose or job of the church or the bride of Christ during the millennial kingdom? Well, I don't have specifics because the Bible doesn't lay out specifics, but in general terms, we are destined to rule and reign. You see that in Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, speaking of the church, it says, You have made 
them to be a kingdom and priests of our God. And they notice the verb, it's in the future. They, we're not reigning now. They will reign where? Up on the clouds somewhere? No, upon the earth. Paul, in speaking to the Corinthians who were involved in litigation against one another, said, do you not know that we will judge the angels? And in the parable of the minas, one man is put in charge of ten cities, another man put in charge of five cities. So the truth of the matter is, as a Christian, we are destined to rule and reign. And what is happening now in your life is preparing you for that role. Much like Joseph, in between ages 17 and 30, all the trials that he went through, it was preparatory for the time when he would be elevated into second in command over all of Egypt. And so as a Christian, uh, one man phrased it this way, today is training time for reigning time. Everything happening in your life is preparing you for your future kingdom role. Go for it. Okay, this question, is the second coming going to occur at Petra or at the Mount of Olives? And my answer to that would be both. Um, Zechariah 14 says that the Lord will return to the Mount of Olives when his foot touches the mountain, it'll split in half and he'll become king over all the earth. But Isaiah 63, when Isaiah has a vision of the second coming of the Lord, his vision is that the Lord goes first uh, to uh, Edom and uh, Basra, uh, which is in the area of Jordan okay. today before he advances on to the Mount of Olives. So it appears that I think what's going to happen is when the Lord comes back, he's going to bring with him angels. He's going to bring with all of us who are believers. Uh, we'll be coming with him. And I think he's going to stop off in uh, Jordan and pick up the Jewish people who are believers also. And he's going to bring us all to the Mount of Olives. And that will be his final point. But it appears from Isaiah 63, he's going first to the area of Jordan. Uh, incidentally, uh, I grew up in a militantly amillennial church. By militant, I mean if you had a different view, you were disfellowshipped. And we only heard one sermon a year on Bible prophecy, one. And that was one that said there's not one verse in the Bible that even implies that Jesus will ever put his feet on this earth again. And when I was 12 years old, I just flipping through the Bible because we never studied the Old Testament. And it just fell open to Zechariah 14. And I read it, and I thought, I just couldn't believe my eyes. So I was scared to death, but I went to my pastor, and 12 years old, and I said, you know, what about Zechariah 14? And he sat there, and he read it, and read it, and read it. I thought he was never going to say anything. And finally, he looked at me, and he put his finger in my face, and he said, son, I want to tell you something. I don't know what this means, but I'll guarantee you one thing. It does not mean what it says. <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead, buddy. <laughs> what can I say after that? <laughs> wow. It's sad, actually, when you think about it. It's very sad. Yep. Okay, so uh, what does the actual word chosen mean when referring to the Jewish people? Um, well, I'll start, what, uh, I'll start the, by the famous line from the Fiddler on the Roof. Um, uh, Tevia, the dairyman, is walking back home at the beginning of the uh, of the story, and of course, his you know his cart, the wheel is not working, the horse is tired, and and he's pulling the whole thing, and he's looking up, and he's going, "Lord, I I know we're the chosen people, but once in a while, could you choose somebody else?" <laughs> so that's you know very often that's what the Jewish people feel. We know we we're the chosen people, but chosen for what? I mean, really, it's, it hasn't been so good in you know two thousand years. So. We are, chosen, uh, we are chosen because this is God's prerogative. He has chosen the Jewish people, but chosen doesn't mean everything that people think it means. The verse I like to go to is in uh, Deuteronomy um, uh, 7, uh, yeah, 7, verse 7 and 8. The Lord, and he's, the Lord is speaking to the church, of course, in Deuteronomy. Of course not. He's speaking to the Jewish people. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So here we are again. I, I, 
I'm really, really big on the covenants. This, if you do not understand the place and the importance uh, of the covenants in the Bible, you will never understand your Bible. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, five of the eight covenants of the Bible that God made between himself and humanity, five of them are with Israel. And of the five he made with Israel, only one is conditional, the Mosaic covenant. All the others are unconditional, eternal covenants he made, the Abrahamic, the, uh, the Davidic, the land, and the new covenant. And all those covenants establish a precedent for God's unique relationship with Israel. He wants, in, uh, originally, we were supposed to be a light to the nations. We didn't do so good. Okay, and but we are still chosen for God's program. God's program is not going to end or res, even resume and end uh, without the Jewish people. And and, and actually, the end of, of 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 the story is when Israel corporately says, "If you heard me say it before, but I love saying it, Baruch, Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai, Blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord." Yeshua says that in Matthew, surely you will not see me again until you say, blessed is you, comes in the name of the Lord. So we are chosen for a purpose. The purpose is, you know, we, we, we are part of God's story. But we, what we are not, under the word chosen, is saved. We, we, we are chosen for, a, for God's story and we are important. But that does not guarantee our salvation. That's dual covenant theology saying, oh, you're Jewish, you don't have to do anything. You know, you're by virtue of being Jewish, you're saved. Uh, again, I told you this morning, Nicodemus thought that. Jesus corrected him very quickly that night when they met. You know, Nick at night, never mind. So, <clears throat> so, so we're chosen for God's purpose, for God's story, but that doesn't mean salvation, and it doesn't mean that we're better. This is just, we are the people he chose, and that's it. I wish he would have chosen somebody else, honestly. All right, question is, what happens to believers who live and die during the millennial period? Where do they fall into the chart of the resurrection? Well, I, I personally believe that no Christian or, or believers will die in the millennium. Uh, if anybody die, I believe it would be the unbelievable. Uh, the scripture is clear on that. Uh, the wicked that die at the age of 100 uh, considered a child. But I think the scripture also follows suit with that. Uh, in Revelation chapter uh, 20, uh, the last resurrection we see for the righteous is those who were beheaded. Look, uh, see, chapter 20, verse 4, John wrote, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, past since they were beheaded. He said, uh, witness who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the, for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither uh, had received a mark upon their foreheads, are uh, in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Verse 6 is key. He says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Now this rest of the dead has reference to the last resurrection and that is only for the unredeemed. Revelation chapter 20, John talks about the uh, 20 verse 11 through 15. He talks about the, the, the last resurrection of the unredeemed. Uh, these are the wicked dead. Uh, Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 John said and I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was uh, found no place for it verse 12 and I saw the dead small and great stand before God uh, this dead here would be the last resurrection of the unredeemed so I believe during the thousand year millennial kingdom uh, no righteous will die uh, only the unredeemed who are considered the wicked uh, they will die, and then they will be a part of that last uh, resurrection. Because uh, there's no other resurrection after this, uh, this resurrection uh, of, of those that were beheaded. Uh, as, uh, as Andy talked about earlier in, in his sessions, which was very good. Uh, so I believe no righteous will die in the millennium. All right. <clears throat> this question is about Matthew 24, 22 where Jesus in the Olivet Discourse says, unless those days had been cut short, no life would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. My understanding of this is that the elect here, and I don't mean to disappoint any 
Calvinists that might be watching. But the elect here is talking about the Jewish people. Um, Olivier mentioned Deuteronomy 7, 7, and 8, where Israel is chosen by God as a nation. You know, Isaiah 65, my chosen ones, referring to Israel, will wear out the works of their hands. And so what this is saying is if the tribulation period was allowed to go one second, one minute, one second beyond its allotted time period, and it's going to be very severe for Israel in the second half, then Israel would be wiped out. Uh, Satan has been pushed out of heaven at this point. Revelation 12, he's plummeting to the earth. He's trying to devour the woman. The spiritual battle, Revelation 12, verses 6 through 17, goes on for a time, times, and a half a time, which is a synonym for three and a half years or 1,260 days. It's the most intense warfare you've ever seen. And if that time period were allowed to go one nanosecond beyond three and a half years, Satan would have the upper hand. The Jewish people would have been wiped out. And if that happened, there would be no one left on the earth for God to fulfill his covenants through. So for the sake of the elect, Israel, those days will be cut short. In other words, the time period can't extend beyond three and a half years because there has to be some believing living Jews left for God to fulfill his covenants through. That, I think, unlocks the meaning to one of the most controversial verses in the Bible. Same chapter, but when you drop down to verse 34, it says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. What generation? It's the generation of Israel that is alive in the second half of the tribulation period that just watched their temple desecrated by the Antichrist. That's the generation that receives that promise. And let me tell you something, then. They're going to need that promise because Satan has is going to launch an all-out war against them. Because in Satan's mind, if he can destroy the Jewish race, the kingdom will never come to the earth. Amen. And if the kingdom never comes to the earth, he continues on as the prince and power of the air. So because that generation is under unique spiritual warfare, God makes them unique promises. Uh, the days will not extend beyond their allotted time, number one. And number two, that generation of Jews living on the earth will not perish. And so they're going to need a lot of help. Next question. <clears throat> will Christians remain in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom or will we be able to travel? Uh, well, first of all, the, the millennial kingdom is going to be a Jewish kingdom where God is going to fulfill the promises he has made to the Jewish people. Uh, Jesus will be King of kings and Lord of lords, reigning from Jerusalem. Therefore, Israel will be the focal point of the whole world. David in his glorified body, I think, is going to be the king of Israel. And we, Christians, in our glorified bodies are going to be scattered all over the earth to reign over those who are in natural bodies. And the degree of responsibility that we're given is part of the rewards that we're going to receive. Uh, part of the rewards we're going to receive is, is rewards of authority based upon how we uh, live for Christ and how we used our gifts for him in this life. And so I believe that every person on planet earth who is in a position of authority during the millennium will be a person in a glorified body. That includes uh, all teachers. That includes um, all uh, people who are in administrative positions like mayors and governors and kings and, and princes. Uh, I think it uh, includes uh, ju uh, ju the judicial branches. All the judges on planet earth will uh, be in glorified bodies. And, and I think that when it says that Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron, I believe that means that uh, when uh, a person in the flesh violates the law, 
They will be arrested, they will be tried immediately, and they will be given an immediate sentence, and there will be no appeal whatsoever, no appeal, because the person who is sitting in that, as that judge is a person of glorified body with the mind of Christ, and he's going to make a perfect decision. And so we're going to be the rule of the rod of iron. I'll tell you what none of us are going to be. None of us are going to be a legislature. There will be no abomination known as the legislature of Texas during the millennium or the United States Congress because Jesus is going to give the law and it's going to be our responsibility to enforce that law. And that's the reason the earth's going to be flooded with peace, righteousness, and justice. As far as traveling, I think we'll be able to travel. In fact, and I have all kinds of fantasies about what heaven is going to be like. The Bible doesn't tell us much about heaven. It just says that we're going to be servants of the Lord and that we're going to see the face of God, which I think means that we're going to have personal, intimate relationship with our Creator. But I have a lot of fantasies about it. And I think in our glorified bodies, we might actually take tours of the universe without a spaceship that we simply go and see, see God's creation up close. I can hardly wait to do that. And we'll be back in time for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> it's yours, brother. <laughs> All right. So uh, how are we doing on time? We good? We're good. We have till 630. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, will raptured believers be able to see any of the tribulation take place? Uh, I, I always go back to the scripture in, uh, in Revelation that says that when we're in glory, uh, you know, it says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no longer any death, no longer any mourning, crying, pain. First things have passed away. When we are in glory, all those things are gone. So I, from that, my deduction, I deduce that we are not going to be able to see what's going on because we're going to be so focused on worshiping the King of Kings that we're not going to be worried about what's, what's behind us. And, and so it's, plus if, you know, if, if somebody is left behind, you know, you're thinking like, well, what about my loved ones, you know, that are left behind that did not, did, you know, this would be so sad if my father, my brother, my sister, my, my children uh, are, are left behind it and, and, they're, and, and I'm gone. I don't think we'll have the ability to worry and be sad about it. What do you guys think? Yeah. Am I a heretic? No. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Well, let me try it one more time. <laughs> um, okay, I'll go this one. Where did they get all the good ones? Will certain places see less wrath or destruction, or will everyone be touched equally? If not, why? I assume that you're talking about the tribulation, and... Uh, I'm just, just in the tribulation, those who are going to suffer are going to suffer with, you know, I mean, they, they, I don't think there's going to, I'm not going to be there, but I think that it doesn't really matter. If you're there, you're going to suffer, and there's only two options. You're either going to suffer for the Lord and die as a tribulation martyr, or you're, going to, you, or you're not going to suffer, and you're going to take the mark of the beast, and then you're going to suffer for a lot longer, a lot longer. You're going to be deceived and a lot longer, but... Uh, Will certain places see less wrath or destruction? I don't know. And can I be very honest with you? I don't care. Because I'm, I, I'm so confident that I'm not going to be there that I'd rather work on getting people with me and not worry about what's going to happen. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad or very bad. Well, bad is bad enough, I think. So. Good question here. Uh, how do I argue that the wheat harvest in Revelation 14, 14 and 16 is not the rapture. Well, one way we know it's not the rapture is, is dispensation where it's at. It's during the time of the tribulation. The church has no part of the tribulation that I shared in, in the message uh, on the rapture this morning. Uh, this is a dispensational event, but this harvest, uh, chapter 14 here, this, this part of it is parenthetical. In other words, God is, he's given us a little more information about what's gonna happen nearing the end. Uh, because you have the harvest of the righteous, and then you also have the harvest uh, of, the, of the wild, uh, wicked grapes. And we know that this gives reference, the second harvest, it gives reference to Armageddon. Uh, the Bible said that these uh, grapes will be gathered uh, to the great wine press of the wrath of God. So uh, dispensationally, period of time-wise, this cannot be the rapture because it's during the tribulation season. Uh, this is not a rapture event for the church. Uh, we, we've already been in heaven by that time, and 
uh, part of the judgment seat and just having a wonderful time, you know. Uh, we won't be here during that time, so. You want to do another one? Uh, well, you can go ahead. I, I got to look at it here. Um, this is a question about Revelation 20, verse 8. They want to know who is Gog and Magog in Revelation 20, verse 8. Um, is this similar to Ezekiel 38 and 39, the physical coalition of nations that will invade Israel in the last days? Revelation 20, verse 8 says, And will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. Now, you, it's very common for people to conflate Ezekiel 38 and 39 with this because the name Gog Magog is used. But there's tons of dissimilarities between those chapters. Um, I try to summarize a lot of them in my little book that's out there on one of the tables entitled The Middle East Meltdown. For starters, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war comes from the north. This one at the end of the millennium comes from all the nations. And we could spend all day talking about differences so one is, in my view, an event that happens towards the beginning of the tribulation. The second one is an event that happens once the tribulation is over and at the end of the millennial kingdom. So the question is, if that's true, why does it say Gog and Magog? It's, um, it's a lot like using the word Waterloo. When we say, I've met my Waterloo, we're not saying the whole battle of Waterloo is being, you know, refought. You know, remember the Alamo? Um, of course, in Texas, we might want to refight that, I guess. But, <laughs> but um, you, you know, it's, it's just a figure of speech, you know, where you're trying to describe something happening in your life uh, to an analogy that you can remember in your history. So by the time the Millennial Kingdom takes place, the Gog-Magog battle is going to be so famous or infamous that it's literally the measure of all future conflicts. And so the conflict here will be so severe, it will be like Ezekiel 38 and 39. But the name Gog and Magog here in Revelation 20 is not designed to connect you with the identical event of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Of course, you wrote a book on that, so maybe you should have answered this question. <laughs> Question, what is the function of the Holy Spirit during the tribulation? In my opinion, the same as today. Um, there are people who have argued over the years that uh, when the rapture occurs, the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the world because the Holy Spirit indwells believers. And there is a special way in which the Holy Spirit indwells believers. But the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. And uh, when the church is taken out, the Holy Spirit is not taken out of the world. Holy Spirit will continue to be here. And one of the greatest evidences of that is the fact that the Bible makes it very clear that during the period of the uh, tribulation, there's going to be a great harvest of souls brought to the Lord. And that's not possible without the Holy Spirit witnessing uh, to them and drawing them to the cross. Okay. How important is it to speak to a person that says they are a Christian and they are saved because they were baptized, but believe in replacement theology, believe you must be water baptized to be saved, don't believe in a rapture, don't believe in the Antichrist, tribulation, millennial reign. P.S. Should I even bother? Yes, <laughs> Should I even bother? No, 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 no. Just one thing that, that the, the one thing that we talked about replacement theology already, and you should always, if, if a person is interested in talking about God, talking about scriptures, talking about Jesus, you should always talk. You should always find the time. Okay? There comes a, a time where people just don't, they don't care. They're not interested. And it happens a lot to me in, in, in Jewish outreach. When I talk to Jewish people, if I see that they're not interested, I'm just going to walk away. I'll pray for them and I'll walk away. But you got to try. You got to honestly see if they're seeking answers or they just want to waste your time. That's up to you and the person. But the one thing that I would want to make clear is that you don't become a Christian by being Water baptized. I don't, care, I don't care what kind of water you use and what kind of method you use. I'll take you to uh, uh, Acts 8 uh, when Philip met the eunuch uh, who was reading the book of Isaiah. There is an order of things there. 
The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me of whom does the prophet say this? Say this of himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with, from the scripture, from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. So from Isaiah, he preached Jesus, which you can, we can all preach Jesus from the Old Testament. Paul did. Uh, as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water. So, uh, and, and Philip, as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. They went down into the water. So, first thing is, it's a full immersion. I don't want to open cans of worms here. But, uh, uh, but it's, first you have to believe. Because you don't get saved by being baptized. You get baptized after you're saved as a declaration to the community. Like, listen, I want to declare to you that, you know, buried with Christ, raised to, to, to live a new life. So it is a, a demonstration of your salvation. Salvation comes first. Baptism comes after. So that's it. What practical things can we do before the digital money comes into effect? What will happen to our cash, 401ks, uh, IR, IRAs, and, and everything else. Well, one, I'm not a financial guy. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't give you any good advice on that. But I will say this. I think the digital age is more dealing with the, the physical cash. Uh, when I talked with this, uh, uh, this securities attorney on the, on the flight, again, he was talking about, and he was saying, like, like the cartel, he said, when this thing actually goes online, which he believes that it's going to happen, he said, I'm more worried about that than anything, he said. And he used some name that, that's in the securities market that I don't know. But it's a certain type of transaction that, that they do. And what happens, he said, that uh, all of the cash at that point would, would basically be worthless because uh, they can't declare it. Uh, if they declare it, then they're going to show that they have been embezzling, or not embezzling, but covering up the money. Uh, so the digital age will really affect hard cash, okay? Uh, now, again, we know we're moving to a cash society. They can track everything that you do. Uh, so, I mean, you know, 401k is, is not in cash, really. It, it's, it's in digital currency. It's in the bank. Um, he also asked me about uh, bitcoins. Uh, I know of a lot of Christians that have invested in bitcoins and have lost a lot of money. Uh, me, personally, I'm not investing in any bitcoin. Uh, because this one is new, uh, and, you know, like this young man, uh, they call him Mini Madoff. Uh, <laughs> the guy has, you know, billions of dollars at the tips of his fingers with just touching a button, and he moved money around, you know. Uh, I would be very, very careful, me personally. Uh, I would be very, very careful with getting into that. But I think, you know, it will go digital, no doubt about it, and I believe it's more for tracking uh, people's, um, you know, buying and selling and, and money. That's the only thing I can say about that. All right. Well, unfortunately, the clock just hit 6.30, and that brings us to the end of our Q&A session. Oh. But I will say this. What do you guys think if we did this exact same thing next year? <laughs> so I guess the answer is yes, right? The the parliamentarian rules, the answer is yes. Um, you guys have been just a tremendous group. We've enjoyed having everybody. And you might be saying to yourself, well, gee, Pastor, um, I'm still kind of here in the Sugarland area, and I, I don't get out until later on tomorrow. Can you recommend a church for me to come to on Sunday morning? <laughs> and I do have a one. recommendation. Uh, Sugarland Bible Church. We have two sessions, a, a Sunday school session where the teaching is for a full hour and Olivier Melnick is going to be teaching that session. It begins at 9.45 a.m. tomorrow and goes till 10.45 a.m. Then we have a break and then we start our main service which starts at 11 a.m. And Don Perkins is going to be giving the sermon, a full-length sermon, for an hour, um, beginning at uh, in that service at 11 a.m. He'll be preaching from about 11.30 to 12.30. And what's the title of your message tomorrow? 
Bible prophecy, God's order of events. And what we're going to do, we're going to give a, a, a general overview of Bible prophecy. Uh, we're going to bring in our prophecy chart, and I'm going to walk you through the chart. And uh, it's going to be a good synoptic journey. Amen. And Olivia, what's your Sunday school lesson on tomorrow? Tomorrow I'm going to be doing uh, a lesson on the Feast of Esther, the Feast of Purim, which is coming around the corner. And I'm going to give you some parallels between the Book of Esther and um, uh, in world history that most people are not aware of. And the other thing is um, Olivier is one of our supported missionaries here at Sugarland Bible Church. And when the missionaries are in town, we like to have them come up during announcements and give a kind of a five minute missions moment. And that's he's it? just that's, five minutes. Yes. <laughs> or she'll cut into Don's time and we can't have that. And he's going to be talking about Chosen People Ministries and, and what that's about. So, And then he's having lunch with the missions committee after that, right? Well, if they still like me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's going to be just a, just a great time, you guys. And I just want to end with the gospel. Jesus' uh, final words on the cross were, it is finished. finished. It's the Greek word tetelestai, which means paid in full. And the only thing that God asks the lost sinner to do is to receive what Jesus has done as a free gift. That's why we work very hard at Sugarland Bible Church to keep the gospel, the gospel, the good news. To, to believe means to trust or to rely upon. And so when the Spirit places someone under conviction, and we know that the Holy Spirit is at work in the world. Jesus said to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When they come under that place of conviction, it requires volition on their part to trust in the finished work of Jesus. That's what the word believe means. It means to trust. It's something more than just intellectual assent. It has to do with the idea of, of trust. Uh, I like to use the issue of Charles Blondin who would uh, walk across a tightrope suspended over Niagara Falls, pushing a wheelbarrow. And he was very effective at this. And he yelled out to the crowd, do you think I can do this feat again? And they all said yes, because they had seen him walk across this tightrope across Niagara Falls, pushing a wheelbarrow over and over again. And so he said to the crowd, okay, which of you wants to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> that's a little different. You're, you're no longer just ascending to something you're trusting. And so that's the only condition that God requires to be right with him is to put your personal trust in him. And so that's why we like to conclude with the gospel. Even as I'm, even as I'm speaking People that are unsure of their eternity can do that. People listening online can do that. People listening to the archives after the fact can do that. And we try to keep the main, th the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. And what's Amen. the main thing? The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me close with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for this group that you brought together. Uh, we're grateful for all of these People, the teachers, musicians, all of with their special uh, expertise that they've lended to this conference. Uh, all the organizers, Lord, you know, uh, thank you for that you brought it all together to create an event which is glorifying to you. I do ask, Lord, that you would give us traveling mercies um, as we travel, some going home, some going to nearby hotels, but I ask for traveling mercies. And I'd ask you give us a great day at church tomorrow. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Have the tables, the tables still open right now?